those videos that I get to re-record. Ooh, joy. Because I originally recorded it, and then I moved it to my thumb drive, and I don't know what happened. It just disappeared. And it's not like one of those situations like with Microsoft Windows where, oh, it's actually a hidden file, and you just need to unhide it. No. No, it, it, it went into the ether. I don't know where it went. And it was 15 minutes long. It was really frustrating. And I get to re-record this now. So, yay, take two. Yay. I was really looking forward to almost being done with this chapter because the next few sections are not that long. But, no, it's not that easy. All right. So, uh, without further ado, uh, let's move on to the section on expected values, covariance, and correlation. So these are expected values in the context of uh, multivariate, uh, uh, or in this multivariate setting, or actually more like bivariate, because we're not going truly multivariate, uh, just as in like general number of variables, we're only dealing with two. Uh, let's talk about an expectation. So expected values. Uh, and we're only talking about functions of the form h of x and y. So in other words, h, uh, h is going to be a function that uh, takes two inputs, two real numbers as an input, and then returns a single real number as an output. And um, so we, we still ultimately are going to have an expected value that is... Uh, acting like a univariate thing. But anyway, this is going to be, we're going to split up into the uh, discrete and continuous cases. Um, we've got, let's uh, say we're going to, in the discrete case, we're gonna sum over uh, possible values for x and y, uh, h of x, y times p of x, y. This will be the expected value in the discrete case. So you should understand this as we have um, uh, possible combinations for uh, X and Y that happen with positive probability. We have our function uh, that um, we're kind of tracking and we have the probability mass function for that combination of X and Y. Um, you end up adding the, the the function evaluated at these combinations of x and y, you add, you add that multiplied with the probability of getting those combinations and the result will be the expected value. Uh, this is probably not the only way you could possibly think about that sum. If you wanted to, you could say, well, this is going to be um, uh, a sum over x and a sum over y, h of x, y, p of x, y. And there's some, so there's some advantages to think of it, thinking of the expected value this way, where you actually have two sums instead of one. And maybe you are more familiar with, with uh, this, this notion of uh, having two instead of one. Maybe this is more comfortable notation to you. But one way or the other, we are adding up the product of this function evaluated at combinations of points x, y, but the probability of getting those combinations. That's what an expected value would be. And another advantage to writing it this way and when, with two sums instead of one is because uh, that actually translates very nicely to the continuous case, which I'm writing down now, where our function h of x, y is multiplied with the probability density function, the joint probability density function uh, for the combined random variables x and y and then we're integrating this dy uh, dx. So this is another way to get uh, the expected value. And these are analogous to what we had before in the univariate cases. These are basically very similar. Uh, you should recognize these expected values as being very similar to what we had before. Uh, by the way, just for what it's worth, uh, this general setup of h of x, y, it includes cases such as h of x, y is equal to x, just x. So effectively, uh, y is ignored by the function, and it just returns x, and it doesn't really care. That's covered. Right? You don't have to have a separate theory for this. 
Um, and in fact, what you'll get is the expected value of x in the end. And it would agree with whatever formula you had for the univariate case. So that's that's covered. But it's also covering situations like h of x, y is x times y, or x plus y, or um, uh, maybe x to the power y. Right, All sorts of different uh, situations are covered in this setting. Uh, although what's what's ultimately happening is uh, we're taking the combination of random variables x and y and mapping them to some real number. So we're applying some operation to both of them. We're not in a way dealing with the expected value of x and y as a vector or as a tuple, which you can do. You could try to come up with a notion of the expected value of x and y where you're comp where you're not mapping down into the real numbers but trying to keep them in a tuple you could do something like that it's just not something we're going to do in this class okay so uh let's do our first example um where we are going to compute the expected value of x times y so uh, x times y is going to be the h of x, y that we saw before. So we're going to compute the expected value of x times y for examples 1 and 2. And you can look at the section 1 video uh, to refresh yourself on what those examples were. Example 1 was the example where we were uh, rolling a die and flipping a coin. Uh, and we had a random variable x that was tracking the number of pips that we saw on the die and a random variable y that was tracking effectively uh, whether the coin was heads or not, but it was returning one when the coin was heads and two when the coin was tails. Okay, so for example one, the expected value of x times y is equal to, well, according to that formula above, we have the sum over values of x and the sum over values of y, um, x, y uh, x times y times uh, p of x, y. Okay, uh, and x, y is going to be um, the function that if that, that's serving our role of, of h. Okay, and uh, x ranged effectively from, uh, from uh, 1 to 6. And y effectively ranged from 1 to 2. Okay. And p of xy was equal to 1 over 12. Well, that's a that's a multiplicative constant, so we could actually factor that out into the front of the sum. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we will factor out uh, 1 over 12 so that it's in front of the sum. Okay, that's 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 nice. Uh, and now we need to figure out the rest of the sum. Hmm, what should we do? Well, actually, let's see. Uh, we've got x right here, and this sum in the middle, uh, this is actually a sum of y. So for all intents and purposes, x is a constant when you're trying to compute this inner sum. So let's uh, factor out x, too. It's not going to factor out of everything. It's only going to factor into, uh, it's only going to factor in front of the inner sum, like so, but that's fine. But wait a minute, we, we can go even further than that. This sum here doesn't depend on x, either. It doesn't care about x. So actually, this sum is going to be the same for all x. And it's effectively a constant with respect to x. So we could factor out that sum too. In fact, we could factor out both sums. And what we end up with is a product of sums. So we could say instead of what we've got right here, uh, let's write instead, um, uh, okay, we've got this. We could write instead the sum from x equals one to six of uh, x times the sum from y equals 1 to 2 of y. Huh. Let's re-examine 1 over 12. Uh, that actually is 1 over 6 times 1 over 2. 
but wait a minute we we this looks really familiar like for example we almost have an expected value right here if we were to bring in that one over six that first sum if we bring that in that's actually an expected value because one over six is the probability mass function of a particular random variable so actually we would end up with an expectation all right let's 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 write it like that um this is going to be um uh the sum from x equals one to six uh x times one over six which by the way one over six is the probability mass function for x alone from x equals one to six well uh let's uh actually we can keep going on with that uh we can do the same thing for one half that's a probability mass function for y so this will be the sum from uh y equals one to two uh y times one half and that is the probability mass function for y. So, oh, look at what we got. What did we just what did we just write? What we just wrote down is that this is equal to the expected value of x by itself times the expected value of y by itself. And we know those expected values. We've already computed those. Those are going to be seven halves times uh, three halves, which is 21 fourths. Oh, we're done. Well, what do you know about that? It turned out that that expected value turned into a pro so the expected value of x times y turned into the product of the respective expected values. And that is in fact not a coincidence. That is a result of the random variables x and y being um, being independent. We established last time that those are independent random variables and when they're independent random variables, um, so in fact, I'll write this down. If, so uh, if you have two random variables that are independent, then that's going to imply that the expected value of x times y is equal to the expected value of x times the expected value of y. So that's actually a direct consequence of those random variables being independent of each other. Now, uh, you, have, uh, you have the implication in one direction, that if these are in fact independent random variables, then the expectation of the product will become the product of expectations. You have implication in that direction, you do not have impl uh, implication in the opposite direction. That is not true. It is not true that if the expectation of the product becomes product of expectations, then the two random variables are independent. That is not true. Um, and in fact, we're going to see later an example showing why that's not true, but all right, that basically resolves, uh, example one, right? Okay. Let's, uh, do example two. Example two is a situation where, um, uh, the, the, the two random variables involved are not independent of each other. So we're not going to get. Uh, that same type of factorization. And, and additionally, we're also working with continuous random variables. So things are going to look a little different. Okay. So the expected value of X times Y, I guess we're using blue, uh, is equal to uh, refresh yourself um, and remember that the PDF, the joint PDF of X and Y was 24 over five to the power four of um, x y. If x was less than or equal to, if x plus y was less than or equal to five, and uh, x was at least zero and y was at least zero. Okay, so um, that's what you get. So in that case, we are computing uh, x y 
f of x, y, and uh, d, y, d, x. I'm going to worry about the bounds of integration in a second. But I don't want to leave this integral like this. I'm going to actually plug in what f of x, y is. And as a result, uh, you can probably recognize uh, that there's going to be some multiplication here and here. So we'll end up with instead on the inside x squared, y squared. And we could, if we wanted to, move over the dy dx. So say dy dx. And then we've got 24 over 5 to the power of 4 on the outside. It's I just like it better on the outside, treating it as a constant. Okay, so we're almost done. But the thing is, though, we don't have the bounds of integration yet. I was leaving that until now. So you may remember from the previous video um, from section 1 that these random variables were effectively like the, the region on which the PDF was positive or, yeah, where it was positive was this triangular region where we have x is greater than or equal to zero, y is greater than or equal to zero, and x plus y is less than or equal to five. Okay, so uh, this is the line y equals five minus x that, cor that is equivalent to this other line, uh, x plus y is less than or equal to five, or x plus y equals five, sorry. Um, and we can, in fact, shade the region over which these two uh, random variables are supported. That's the, that's the term that uh, mathematicians like to use, um, where the PDF is positive. Okay, so it's on this region, and when we're doing the integral, we're, so we're doing dy first, so that means that x is treated as fixed. If we uh, are fixing x, we draw a vertical line we're crossing at x equals zero, or, no, at y equals zero, and uh, let's change the color. Crossing at y equals zero, that's where we enter, and we exit at y equals x minus five, or no, not x minus five, five minus x. So we got five minus x here. So that's what happens when we fix x first, but then when we allow x to vary, x is ranging from zero to five. So that'll be the bounds of the outer integral. Okay, so. Uh, what we got? Well, we can now say that this is 24 over 5 to the power of 4. Uh, the x that's inside of this integral, the only way this integral actually depends on x is in the boundaries. So x, for example, isn't there, it's not like x to the power of y or anything like that. So this is a, a multiplicative factor that we can factor out of that inner integral. So we can instead write uh, the integral from zero to five. We've got x squared, and then we got the integral from zero to five minus x, y squared dy, and then dx. Okay, okay. Well, that inner integral is okay. Um, I'm actually going to say uh, we've got a factor of 3 in that 24. So I'm going to factor out a 3 and write that as 8 instead so that I can write 3y squared here. The reason why being that there's a very nice antiderivative for 3y squared, which is y cubed. So I can now say that this integral is 8 over 5 to the power 4. And then we got the integral 0 to 5, x squared. And then inside we got y cubed where y ranges from 0 to 5 minus x dx. Okay, and this is going to be 8 over 5 to the power of 4, integral from 0 to 5, uh, x squared, and uh, we're going to have 5 minus x cubed when we evaluate uh, that expression. Okay, now we got an integral in terms of x. Uh, it's x squared times a perfect cubed. So let's uh, uh, let's uh, let's uh, foil out that perfect cubed. So we're gonna have eight over five to the power of four integral from zero to five, and when we factor that inner term, we're going to get um, 125 x squared minus 75 
x cubed uh, plus 15 x to the 4 uh, minus x to the 5th dx. Okay, and then this is going to be 8 over 5 to the power 4. And then we actually do the antiderivative stuff. And what I have in my notes, I'm guessing that this is probably the best way to approach it, um, or at least the most uh, numerically efficient way. We're going to have 125 x cubed over 3 uh, minus 75 over 4 x to the power 4 uh, plus 15 over 5 x to the fifth power minus x to the sixth power over 6 and x is going to range from 0 to 5 and if you were to plug in that value for x what I have written down in my notes is that this becomes um, 8 times 5 squared times 1 third minus 3 fourths plus 3 fifths uh, minus 1 sixth. I'm guessing that that is probably the uh, after you factor out common factors and all that stuff, I think that's what you that's what you end up with. And in the end, after you uh, do the arithmetic, the resulting number is ten thirds. So this uh, expected value way at the beginning is equal to ten thirds. It's probably a good idea to like it, it's so easy in the process of these calculations to forget what it was that you were actually calculating after you have set up the expectation so i don't know maybe go ahead and like rewind and watch that again and think about what exactly was being computed like remember at the end of the day what we computed was an expectation right and to me that's the most interesting fact that it was an expectation okay um here is some uh r code for there was that so for the example one situation where you had the coin and the dice, uh, here's the expected value of x times y, which is 5.25, which is 21 over 4, which is what we got before. Okay, now that we have um, expectations in this multivariate situation, we can start talking about notions such as covariance and correlation since those are... Um, since those notions are essentially notions relating to expectations. All right, so the we, we start with the covariance. The covariance is our first measure of the relationship between two random variables. So the covariance between x and y is equal to the expected value of x minus the expected value of x. So x minus its mean times y minus its mean. So y minus the expected value of y. This is the covariance. So the covariance is going to be positive if the two random variables tend to be large together. Uh, large together, let's think about what that means. That would mean that um, both of these random variables tend to be above their mean. Right, so when these when both of these random variables tend to be above their mean together, then the covariance will be positive. And and when I say above their mean, the reason why I'm saying above their mean is because what you're effectively measuring is the sign of of x minus the expected value of x and y t minus the expected value of y and the product of the of their individual signs. So if they both tend to be above their mean together, or if they both tend to be below their mean together then that product will be positive and that will be like the dominant uh, part of this expectation uh, the part that gets the most mass and as a result you get a positive expectation if the covariance is negative then that would suggest that when x is above its mean or when this thing is positive uh, the the red factor tends to be negative or vice versa so you could have a situation where Whenever x is above its mean, y tends to be below its mean, or when x is below its mean, y tends to be above its mean. So you can have a situation like that, and that in such a situation, that would mean that most of the mass uh, 
is concentrated in the region where uh the two where where uh x is uh where either x is um above its mean and y is below or vice versa so in that situation so in other words that the most of the region uh, most of the mass is in the region where the or the product of these two factors tends to be negative so as a result uh, you get a negative covariance if the covariance between the two of them is zero then x and y are said to be uncorrelated okay uh, we also have the following shortcut formula for the covariance and if you've been paying attention this may look familiar to you like this may rhyme with something that you've seen before even just the fact that we have a shortcut formula should rhyme with something that you've seen before this is going to be the expected value of x times y minus the expected value of x times the expected value of y so the shortcut formula helps make it clear that there is in fact a relationship between the covariance and the variance the covariance is of x with itself is going to be the variance of x so in a way covariance almost generalizes the notion of variance uh, but yeah you ha and that's almost immediately evident when studying this shortcut formula although it's also immediately evident when you look at the definition of covariance okay um notice that the covariance is not insensitive to the units of the random variable that is it cares about the units and the reason why is because we have the following relationship uh, the covariance of ax plus by, no, ax plus b times c y plus d, which corresponds to a shifting and scaling of the random variables in question. That covariance is equal to a times c times the covariance of x and y. Okay, um, so how should we interpret this? Well, what this means is the units are going to show up as a product. So if you're measuring the covariance between uh, the height of a person and a person's weight, height will be measured in, say, let's say uh, meters. Okay, let's measure a person's, a person's height in meters and their weight in kilograms. Then the units of the covariance will be uh, meter kilograms. Which is like, what the heck is that? What is a meter kilogram? I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, if you were talking about two things that were essentially the same thing, like, for example, a person's weight and the and the weight of their, let's say, arm, uh, then you would end up with your unit, units being kilograms squared, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that's an unfortunate thing. Uh, the fact that this uh, measure does care about units. And if you change the units in which you measure your random variables then the covariance itself will change. Rather unfortunate, because you would like to have a measure of the relationship between the two variables that doesn't care about their units. Uh, because at some level, at the end of the day, these random variables are either very closely related to each other, in other words, knowing one of these random variables gives you a lot of information about the other one, or they're not very closely related to each other. So knowing... Um, one random variable gives you very little information, maybe no information about the other. Um, now, one thing that is that is also that you should note from this formula is that uh, the covariance is insensitive to location. It didn't care about the shift by B and D in the random variables. Okay, that's uh, comforting. Uh, we don't want a measure that cares about where on the plane these random variables are located, but we need to do something about this dependence on units. And for that, we create a new metric called the correlation. Uh, by the way, the covariance is often denoted with the Greek letter sigma, but we'll put x, y to mean the correlation between x and y, whereas the Greek letter usually representing correlation is rho. Okay? All right. So the correlation between x and y that is equal to the covariance of x and y divided by the standard deviation 
of x times the standard deviation of y. Because we don't want to just like divide by the units. Like that, that would be unfortunate. Uh, that would not really do much for us. Dividing by the units in which we're measuring our random variables still doesn't eliminate the dependence of our measure on uh, the units in which the random variables were measured. What we want to do is renormalize by how much these random variables are varying around their means. That's what we should be doing instead to effectively remove uh, the the uh, dependence on units. In fact, you sh could probably study uh, this formula right here and conclude that what the co correlation is doing is computing the covariance after we have divided the random variables by their standard deviations so that in effect the standard deviation of the random variables is one. So it's, re it's rescaling the random variables to force their standard deviation to be one and then measuring the dependence amongst the random variables. So we end up in the end with a unit free measure of the linear relationship between x and y. The correlation is a un is a measure without units. Sometimes I see people uh, mention correlation with percentages and that's not right. That's not what you like the percentage really doesn't mean anything. I would I would strongly avo uh, recommend avoiding such descriptions of correlation. Um, e I've even seen such descriptions in, in websites that I've referenced just like uh, that website on spurious correlations, they reference correlations as percentages, and I don't like that uh, because that's not what it is. It's a number between negative one and one. Uh, the correlation is uh, between negative one and one. It's going to be zero if the random variables are uncorrelated, which should be clear because the numerator is going to be zero because the cov covariance is zero. And then uh, you... Uh, uh, you also have the extremes where you have a correlation of 1 or negative 1. So if the correlation is 1, then that means that there's a perfect linear relationship between the variables. So uh, in, in effect, uh, one variable y is equal to uh, a plus b times x. So if you knew what x was, you automatically know what y is in effect. right? So there's a perfect linear relationship between the variables um, and it's in the positive direction so as one is increasing the other tends to increase as well so you would actually also know that b is greater than zero and uh, if your correlation is negative one then there's a perfect negative relationship between the, the variables um, so that would correspond to a b less than zero um, so those are kind of the extremes and everything in between gives us a sense of how strongly these random variables are related. For example, a correlation of 0.9 would suggest they're not perfectly, one is not perfectly predicting the other, but it's but it gives you a lot of information about how, where the other one is. So in a way, and we'll actually see this with uh, some later formulas, um, if you know what X is, then if you were to think about the distribution of Y conditioned on X, the standard deviation of the conditioned random variable is much smaller than if you didn't know that information. Um, so whereas a small correlation coefficient that's closer to zero than to one would mean that knowing something about X does tell you something about what Y is, but doesn't give you too much information, right? Or I don't know if, if too much information is quite the right word but it doesn't uh, reduce the standard deviation of your, of, of your y after conditioning all that much. It's still largely uh, about as variable as it used to be. So that would be if you're close to zero. And if you were at zero, then in a way, this linear relationship doesn't tell you really anything at all. And we're talking about linear relationships here because Correlation is for linear relationships. It doesn't measure nonlinear relationships. It's possible that you have a correlation of zero and there is still a relationship between your uh, random variables that is possibly nonlinear and you're just not capturing it. Um, so uh, the magnitude of your cor correlation coefficient rho 
determines the strength of the relationship. Uh, strength being the in the sense of how much information one random variable gives you about the other, or alternatively, uh, like how much if you knew one random variable, how much the the standard deviation of the distribution of the condition version of the other random variable changes uh, and reduces. Or and and then the sign of the correlation coefficient uh, that tells you the direction of the relationship. So if it's positive, then that means that these two random variables tend to be large together. If it's negative, they tend to be in um, opposite. They tend to move in opposite directions. So if one tends to be large or larger than its mean, the other tends to be smaller than its mean, and and vice versa. Okay, so. Um, and yeah, it's a unitless relation. It's a unitless measure. So you don't get to say percent. You don't get to say anything like that. It's just a number between negative one and one. It has no units. Okay. Uh, so uh, example six, compute the covariance and correlation for the random variables mentioned in examples one and two. So in example one, uh, we're going to be using that shortcut formula. So the covariance of X and Y is equal to uh, the expected value of x, y minus the expected value of x times the expected value of y. And actually, we established that these two quantities are equal to each other, which means that this is equal to 0. And in fact, that's because they're independent random variables. And that's not a coincidence. Um, independent random variables automatically are uncorrelated. Which makes sense because you think of correlation as describing um, like if you're if two random variables are correlated then that's suggesting that they depend on each other which means that if you knew information about one random variable that gives you information about the other one so that should not so you should not have a, a non-zero correlation if two random variables really truly were independent because that kind of violates this notion that uh, knowing something about one random variable tells you nothing about the other one. Yeah, so uh, we can then say based off of this that the correlation between x, y is equal to uh, zero divided by standard deviations, but you're just going to end up with zero in the end. Okay. Uh, for example two, uh, things are... Uh, not much more complicated. Okay, so uh, for example two, uh, the covariance between the random variables x and y, uh, that is going to be, um, so that's the expected value of x, y, uh, minus the expected value of x, times the expected value of y, but I've already written that above, so I probably shouldn't write it again. All right, so let's not just repeat what we've already written down. Let's write down what those numbers were. Well, the expected value of x, y was 10 over 3. And the expected value of x was equal to the expected value of y, and they were both 2. So this will be 10 minus 2 squared, which is 10 thirds uh, minus 4 which is 10 thirds minus 12 thirds, which is negative two thirds. So that's the covariance between the two uh, random variables. The units of this thing is going to be pounds squared since X was the number of uh, almonds in pounds and, or, and Y was the amount of cashews, or maybe one was cashews and the other was almonds, I don't know. But they were both measured in pounds. Now, uh, the correlation between x and y is going to be negative two-thirds, the covariance, divided by the standard deviation of x times the standard deviation of y. But both of those standard deviations were 1. So we get negative, two, uh, negative two-thirds divided by 1 times 1, which is equal to negative 2 thirds. So the fact, so the correlation and the covariance were the same in this example, which is pure coincidence. Um, I guess I chose random variables that, uh, I guess the way I set up that problem uh, 
the random variables involved had a standard deviation of one, which was not on purpose. Um, uh, if we were to change from a five pound bag to a 10 pound bag, we'd probably get something else for the standard deviation of these random variables. But, well, it is what it is. Um, so, oh, that almost looks like the absolute value of X in the bottom. That's unfortunate. So one times one. So yeah, but they ended up being the same in this one, but that's a coincidence. Okay, uh, for example one, I computed the covariance and it was zero and that's not surprising. So if X and Y are independent, then the covariance is gonna be zero. So you automatically get that for independent random variables, they're uncorrelated. The converse is not true in general. It is not true in general that if you have uncorrelated random variables, they are independent. Here is an, an example that demonstrates this point. Okay, uh, this is a, a, a more numerical example. We have a point uv, and u is effectively, uh, u is a random variable tracking like the x co coordinate of our order pair, and v tracks the y. And this is equally likely to be any one of the points uh, 1, 1, 1, negative 1, uh, 1, negative 2, uh, negative 1, 2, and negative 1, negative 2. Okay, so we got 1. Negative one, uh, negative two, and two, and then we got one, we got negative one. Okay. Okay, so uh, it's equally likely to be any of these points. Effectively, what we do is we pick one of these four points at random, and the x coordinate of the point will be u, and the y coordinate will be v. All right, that's the setup. Each one of them equally likely. All right, compute the covariance of u and v. Are u and v independent? Uh, before we do that, let's compute the marginal distributions of u and the marginal distribution of v so that we can compute their expectations. So, um, so the marginal distribution for u with respect to u is going to be, well, let's see, uh, there's going to be a zero otherwise at some point, but I know, so I know it's going to show up at some point, but let's uh, not worry about that for now. Uh, what are things that you could be? Well, you could either be negative one or one. Okay. Negative one or one. And, uh, what is probably that it's going to be negative one? Well, there are two points that we could possibly select that would cause it to be negative one and they're equally likely. And there's two points that we could select to cause it to be one and they're both equally likely. So two out of four times it will be negative one and two out of four times it'll be one. So uh, this will be one half uh, if uh, u is either negative one or one. Okay, so PV of little v, what is that going to be? All right, so v is now in the y direction and v is actually one of four numbers and each of those four numbers are equally likely. So it's just gonna, so the probably is gonna be one fourth uh, if we have v being either negative two, negative one, one or two, and it's gonna be zero otherwise. All right, so uh, what is the expected value of u. Well, the expected value of u is going to be um, 1 times 1 half uh, plus negative 1 times 1 half, which is 0. All right. Uh, the expected value of uh, v, it's going to be, um, it's going to be uh, negative 2 times 1 fourth uh, plus negative 1 times 1 fourth uh, plus 1 times 1 fourth plus 2 times 1 fourth, which again is equal to 0. All right, so that will mean that the expected value of u times the expected value 
of v is going to be equal to zero. Okay, and uh, how about the expected value of u times v? Well, let's see, what will u times v end up being? We could view u times v as its own random variable, as a random variable that's derived from two other random variables. So what will the product of u and v be at each of these points? Well, at this lower point, we'll have negative uh, 1 times negative 2, which is 2. And at this uh, upper point, we have negative uh, 1 times 2, which is negative 2. Uh, in the right quadrant, we'll have um, 1 times 1, which is 1. And the lower right-hand quadrant, we have 1 times negative 1, which will be negative 1. And each of those points are equally likely. Each one of those numbers is equally likely. So we're going to get, um, no, I want black. I want it painted black. All right, we'll have, excuse me, um, one fourth times two uh, plus one fourth times negative two plus uh, one fourth times one plus one fourth times negative one. And that also is equal to zero. Okay, which means in the end that the covariance between u and v is equal to 0 minus 0, which is equal to 0. And you might be thinking, well, the reason why is because everything is 0. But we could also could um, add 1 to all of our random variables, and the covariance would still be 0. Because, in a way, when you look at that definition of our covariance formula, it automatically recenters the random variables so that their mean is zero, and then it computes their relationship. That's effectively what it's doing. So it didn't really matter the fact that this that these multiply to zero. We could have changed where these points were located so long as we move them in a rigid fashion, and we still would have gotten a covariance of zero. And in fact, maybe try it out, right? Add 1 to everything. Add 1 to every number that you saw. And you're still going to get a covariance of 0. Okay. Uh, but now the question is, are these two random variables independent? So u and v, we have established r, are uncorrelated. All right. Are they independent? Well, the probability that... Uh, v equals 2, given that u equals 1, which corresponds to a conditional probability mass function, well, that is equal to 0. Because if you know that v is equal to 1, then you are going to be one of the two points in the pink box. And in none of those points is u... E no. Okay, if v is... If u is 1, my apologies... If u is 1, then you are in the pink box, in which case a v of 2 is impossible, or at least improbable. Um, improbable meaning that the probability is 0. So you're not going to get, you're not going to see a v of 2. So that probability, that conditional probability is equal to 0, but that is not equal to... Uh, the marginal probability distribution of v at 2 times the marginal probability distribution of u at 1, which is 1 half times 1 fourth, which is 1 eighth. Those are two different numbers. 0 is not equal to 1 eighth. So they are not independent. So you have two random variables here that are uncorrelated but not independent. And the reason why is because there is a relationship between u and v. It's just not a linear one, right? There is no linear relationship between u and v, but there is a relationship between u and v. Okay, and in fact, here is some uh, more R code that is um, uh, trying to model these random variables. Uh, if you're if you're wondering how exactly this is working out. Here's a, a description. Uh, these probabilities, what we're doing is we um, 
to to enter the probabilities, uh, we have to give possible values for uh, each of the variables. So first we have possible values for u, and then we have possible values for v, and those are passed as vectors to a, as vectors in a list. And we then write down the probability of each combination of values for those vectors. So the co uh, combination negative one and two, negative one and negative two has a probability one fourth. The probability the probably the combination negative one and negative one is zero. And the combination negative one and one has a probability of zero. And the combination negative one and two has a probability of one fourth. Then after we have accounted for uh, the negative one for the first one, we then try one and say, okay, probably of one and negative two is zero. The probability of one and negative one is gonna be one fourth. Uh, the probability of 1 and 1 is 1 fourth, and the probability of 1 and 2 is 0. That's how uh, those probabilities get written down, and that's how you could possibly uh, create discrete random variables that are not necessarily regularly distributed, not distributed in like this uh, nice square way, but in this case, a more trapezoidal way. Okay, um, so we then create marginal distributions for u and v, R is going to be tracking the relationships between U and V. So that means that this computation will still compute an expected value. But then we ask whether they are independent and it says no. It's able to do that check and say that they are not independent random variables. Okay, uh, we now wrap up this section by discussing an, a particular continuous distribution of interest. Uh, where correlation is an important parameter. Uh, and this is the bivariate normal distribution. We say that x1 and x2 follow a bivariate normal distribution, or how, or another way to say this is that the tuple x1, x2 follows a bivariate normal distribution with mean parameters mu1 and mu2 and standard deviation parameters sigma1 and sigma2 and correlation parameter rho if the joint PDF is given is what I'm about to give you, which is a very long miss. Okay. What do I have written down? All right. This is not pretty. All right. We have F. Oop. Uh, uh, stop it f of x, y, the joint PDF equals 2 pi sigma 1 sigma 2 um, times the square root of 1 minus rho squared all to the power negative 1 half. And then I'm going to write exp because I don't want to write e to the power of stuff because it's going to be a mess. Just know that exp of x is equal to e to the power of x. It's just notationally more clean when writing out this formula and easier to read and understand if we write it like this using this exp function. So it's going to be exp of, oh boy, um, negative 1 over 2 one minus rho squared, and then multiplied with, oh boy, yesterday I was able to get this all on one line and I don't think I'm gonna be able to do that again. Uh, so we've got x minus mu one over sigma one squared minus two times rho times x minus mu one over sigma 1, x minus mu 2, over sigma 2, uh, plus, oh, we're going to have just enough space, uh, y minus mu 2 over sigma 2. All that squared, and then close the parentheses. Okay, we just barely made it. All right, that is the PDF of these two random variables. All right, it's hideous. 
it's it's not pleasant. Um, uh, although I, as someone who's quite familiar with probability, I can I can kind of appreciate the beauty of it. Um, if there is any, like for example, like I can identify what parts are familiar to me. Like for example, uh, this part looks very much like what we saw before when we saw the PDF of the normal, uh, in including the stuff up here. That looks rather familiar. If row were zero, it would make a lot of sense. But yeah, it's not too pretty. And honestly, if you're in my class, don't worry too much about the PDF of the normal of, of the bivariate normal. There's more important things I'd rather you be worrying about. Okay, uh, continuing on. Uh, uh, you know, there's an expression for the PDF, but. It's also nice to see a picture of it. So here's some R code that creates a picture. I'm not going to explain it too much. Um, uh, in the end, this is the resulting plot of the joint probability density function of uh, two bivariate normal random variables. Or two random variables whose joint distribution is a bivariate normal distribution. Notice how it's got this very nice and lovely bell shape. Um, and it's very smooth. And uh, yeah, here's a contour plot of the points. And actually, it, it you can't. It's it's not super easy to see just because of the fact that the plot itself has an unequal length and width, or width and height. But these are actually perfect circles. Uh. It's just that the plot itself is a little distorted, but the cer but it actually has perfect circles for cross sections. Okay, and maybe you could like uh, I don't know how easy it would be, uh, but maybe try to look at the level curves of the uh, bivariate normal, and I I think you should be able to discover that in the end you're dealing with perfect circles. So although okay, actually I should probably also mention that this is the joint PDF for the bivariate normal distribution um, with parameters 0, 0, 1, 1, and 0. So the means are 0, the uh, standard deviations are 0, uh, no, the standard deviations are 1, and the correlation is 0. So that's, and I bet that if you knew that that you could probably like compute what the level curve is for an arbitrary c greater than zero solve this out and you probably discover oh what you get is a circle so uh the level curves of this thing are circles uh the effect of changing row this row parameter would be these would turn from circles to um angled ellipses so you'd have uh you would have ellipses that uh looks something like this instead for the level curves uh, and if you were to change the standard deviations you would have ellipses that are parallel to the x and y axis uh so rho will change the orientation of the ellipses uh here's another level plot but this one being colored it's uh using like a uh, topographical color scheme to understand it. Like if, if we were viewing this bivariate normal distribution as a mountain, what would it look like? Just in case that's uh, more enlightening to you. Uh, one thing interesting about this, uh, about this PDF, which you could discover by playing with it, uh, is um, when you're fixing X and Y, the result... If you look at the slices of this distribution, as in you imagine running a slice uh, through the plane and then looking at the cross sections, you're always getting normal distributions in the end, right? If you're running straight lines. So they're always looking like these bell curves. And additionally, uh, if you were to look at the marginal distributions, which is not just slicing, but actually collapsing the volume of this shape into a plane so collapsing the volume down uh the cross the the marginal distributions are also normal distributions so there's normal distributions everywhere 
with the bivariate normal distribution. So the marginal distributions are normal and conditional distributions are also normal. All right, so uh, in fact, I can give you the parameters of those distributions. So uh, for the marginal distributions, x1 is following a normal distribution with mean mu1 uh, and standard deviation sigma1. So the bivariate normal is parameterized effectively by parameters describing the marginal distributions uh, parameters, which is quite nice because then you can just read off uh, the parameters of the marginal distributions. And then one additional parameter that describes the relationship between the two random variables, uh, rho. So you have that additional random variable for that captures their correlation. So those are the marginal distributions. And now for the conditional distributions. Uh, so x1 given x2 is equal to little x2. So this is the random variable x1 after you condition x2 and claim that you know what x2 is. It will follow a normal distribution. Its mean will be mu1 plus rho times sigma1 over sigma2. And then x2 minus mu2. And then we've got the square root of 1 minus rho squared times sigma1. All right, and that's the uh, conditional distribution for x1 when you know what x2 is. And actually, let's uh, look for a second. Let's appreciate this formula for a second. Rho is a number between 0 and 1. So rho squared is going to be a number. Well, okay, rho is a number between negative 1 and 1, which means that rho squared is a number between 0 and 1. And as you increase the magnitude of rho, what you're effectively doing is decreasing the standard deviation of the conditioned random variable, which is what how I should, um, which is how you should be interpreting what, uh, which is what I said earlier about what that correlation is doing, uh, or what the number, the magnitude of the correlation does. It effectively reduces how much uncertainty there is about one ver one of the random variables when you know what the other one is. Uh, the conditional distribution of x2 when you know that x1 is equal to little x1. That's also going to be a normal distribution with mean mu2 and, oh no, mean mu2 plus rho sigma2 over sigma1. This should not be too shocking. Uh, times x1 minus mu1. And its standard deviation is the square root of 1 minus rho squared uh, sigma2. Okay, uh, so notice that the, the marginal means are mu1 and mu2 respectively, the marginal standard deviations are sigma1 and sigma2 respectively, and the correlation between the root two random variables is rho. So crucially, now there's an important fact. I earlier said that correlation does not imply, uh, does not imply, or being uncorrelated does not imply independence. And that is true in general. But if your random variables are in fact bivariate normal random variables being uncorrelated, so I actually should uh, change this and say um, if the covariance of um, x1 and x2 is zero, so being uncorrelated does imply independence if they're following a bivariate normal distribution. If they're not following a bivariate normal distribution, this is not the case. And by the way, what does it take for something to follow a bivariate normal distribution? It takes all of the stuff that I've talked about to this point, and, uh, and more specifically, it is not sufficient that two random variables have marginal distributions that are normal in order for the two of them together to follow a bivariate normal distribution. You can invent examples of random variables whose marginal distributions are uh, normal distributions and who are uncorrelated, but they are not independent because their joint distribution is not bivariate normal. Right. And actually I describe how you would construct such an example here. Okay, um, let's see an example of using the bivariate normal. <clears throat> 
Let HC represent the height of a son and HF the height of the son's father in inches. Sorry to you international students, we're still using inches here. Suppose um, these two random variables are following a bivariate normal distribution uh, where the mean parameters are the same, they're both 69.2. The standard deviation parameters are the same, they're both 2.6. And the correlation between the, a son's height and a father's height is 0 0.4. What are the marginal distributions of HC and HF? Well, that's actually quite easy to answer because the marginal distributions can be read off directly from the, from the parameters of the bivariate normal. So HC is going to follow a normal distribution with mean 69.2 and standard deviation 2.6. HF is going to also follow a normal distribution with mean parameter 69.2 and standard deviation 2.6. Okay, uh, how then, or, all right, well, okay, well, that answers that. Um, nothing particularly exciting here. Uh, part two is where things get a little bit more interesting. Suppose a person's father is 78 inches tall. Find an equal-tailed interval such that the probability of the child's height is in this interval is 0 0.95. So um, I want to find an equal-tailed interval, and I have a note here saying, we have to say equal tailed because otherwise we would not have a problem with a unique solution. Uh, but uh, you, you say that it's just as likely for the, for the sun to either be too tall or too small. And now you have a unique solution. Okay. So I want the distribution of the sun's height, given that the father's height is 78 inches. And according to the formula that we wrote down before, that's going to be a normal distribution with mean 69.2, excuse me, plus uh, 0 0.4, and then we've got 2.6 divided by 2.6. Uh, and then we got 78 minus 69.2. And then our standard deviation is 2.6 times the square root of one minus 0.4 squared and then when we figure out the numbers that we've actually got there's going to be some rounding but neglecting the rounding error we're going to have a mean of 72.72 and a standard deviation of 2.383 all right let's take a second before we proceed to appreciate what we just wrote down so the father's height is known to be 78 inches and on average, people tend to be 69.2 inches, at least in this example. So the father is taller on average. The son has a predicted height. Like, the, like if you had to pick a number, you would use the expected value. And based off of this information, the son's expected height is 72, or let's round up to 73 inches. So what do we notice about this? Well, the son is probably going to be taller on average. Thing though is, he's not probably not going to be as tall as his dad, which is kind of funny. Um, this is actually an example of a general phenomenon uh, known as regression to the mean. So what that means is uh, the sun will probably be taller than average, but he's going to be closer to the average height of all individuals than his father, at least in expectation. So you have this you know, this uh, regression going back to the mean, right? In fact, this is the reason why we use the word regression in regression analysis, because regression analysis, um, which is like looking at the relationships among variables, linear relationships among variables, um, it was first used to study the relationship of heights between fathers and sons and the uh, people who were developing those methods uh, the statistician who did so noted there seems to be this regression phenomenon where tall, uh, where the children of tall people tend to also be tall, but not as tall as their parents. And uh, the children of short people also tend to be short, but not as short as their parents, um, at least in relation to the mean. So you have this regression, and that's the reason why we still call it regression. It, like The term regression itself is mostly a historical term because this was the first situation where it showed up. But this is a phenomenon that's 
generally suggested whenever you run any sort of a net regression analysis. Um, okay, so that's the first thing that we're going to appreciate uh, this, uh, this mean. I was actually talking yesterday. This almost suggests some strange dynamics between generations where you have, let's say, some individual and they're taller on average, so they're tall. What will be the behavior of this individual's descendants? Well, this uh, individual's child will probably also be tall, um, but probably not as tall as his father. And, um, and, and when we say that, he could either be taller than what we predict or shorter than what we predict. And you could imagine um, that um, this child will also have a person who is either taller or shorter than on, a than on average, and this is kind of keeps on going. So you can imagine a person's descendants kind of like they're tall, but their descendants will probably alternate between tall and short over time. Um, like some of his descendants, like there will be a period where his posterity will be taller than average. And then there's a period where his posterity, like one of them tends to be is suddenly really short. So they all tend to be really short. And uh, so, so that person has short descendants too. And then they go back to being tall again. It's just kind of this weird phenomenon. Okay, so that's the first thing I wanted to appreciate. The second thing I want to appreciate is the standard deviation. The standard deviation is less than what it was if we didn't make a prediction about, or if we didn't know what the father's height was. And this is because of the correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is 0.4, and that causes the um, standard deviation to decrease when we condition on the other variable. And in fact, it didn't really matter what the father's height was, the standard deviation was always going to be this number. The moment that the correlation was set to be 0.4. So that means that the moment you um, condition on uh, the father's height, then you uh, get a, a smaller standard deviation. And if the correlation were larger between them, like if it were one, the standard deviation would be zero. In which case, there's basically no randomness left. The, this person will be, um, what it, like, there. This person will be some function of the father's height. Um, whereas if it, if it were zero, the standard deviation would be exactly the same. But also the the expected value would be uh, sixty nine point two because this because the correlation shows up actually in two places here and here. Okay. So that's something to think about um, when looking at formulas like this. It's good to appreciate for a second the meaning of what you just wrote down. Okay. Uh, going back to the actual problem, I wanted an interval to predict the sun's height. Well, we know this. Uh, the probability that HC minus 72.72 .72 divided by uh, 2.383 given uh, the father's height. So the probability that this quantity, which after you condition, is going to follow a standard normal distribution, the probability that it will be within two standard deviations so between negative two and two is approximately 0.95. This probability also can be manipulated. You can multiply, uh, so multiply everything by 2.383 to clear out the denominator. All right, so those will cancel and then add to everything uh, 72.72. So add 72.72 to everything, which will cause a cancellation here. And what you end up with is the probability that, um, so what this will imply is that the probability that HC is between uh, 
nine five and seventy seven point four nine given that the high of the father uh, was uh, 78 that's also equal to 0.95 so that would so then to come up with our prediction interval we just take uh, these two endpoints these two endpoints will be our interval so the interval is approximately because we made some approximations here uh, 67.95 and 77.49. Okay, and that's it. And in fact, uh, here's some R code that's doing very similar things. I got the Marshall distributions. Well, I got the Marshall distributions. I got the uh, conditional distributions parameters. And then I got... Uh, the quantiles for the corresponding lower and upper bound. The lower bound is the 2.5th percentile, and the upper bound is the 97.5th percentile. So that gets us the boundaries, which are pretty close to our um, approximation. So uh, that's it. Uh, that's it for this section. Uh, we'll be moving on to... I actually think that section 5 is a more natural successor to section 2. And also is better in between section three and four than after section three and four. It makes more sense if you talk about section five before those other ones. So I'm going to be recording that one next. And you can watch that one next. And I think it's better if you do it that way. But we're going to be talking about uh, even more random variables. Uh, lots and lots of random variables. Expectations of linear combinations. And then we get to move on to uh, two important theorems. Uh, but we also have to talk about the distribution of statistics too. Uh, but we're starting to move back into statistics. Uh, we're getting even closer. So uh, watch those uh, videos. And uh, until then, uh, have a good day.